Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. The child beauty queen found murdered in her Colorado home. Boulder police detectives have now returned from interviewing about 30 people in Georgia where John Bonet Ramsey has relatives and where she was buried. A spokeswoman says the police have also been in contact with the girl's mother and father and hope to interview them later this week. We feel like there are at least two people on the face of this earth that know who did this. hit your sister over the head with a baseball bat or a flashlight? Absolutely not. This was a child who was put to bed by her parents and never woke up. Until the day we die, we'll be looking for the person that murdered our daughter. Welcome back to another I Could Murder a Podcast. This is episode number 10. I'm Tom Norris. This is Ben Carter. And this is a very special episode, isn't it, Ben? So a very special case indeed, as voted for by our followers on Instagram. So thank you very much to everybody who took part in that. It did get quite heated. And Tom, I'll be honest, there are a lot of people who are very unhappy with you right now. <laughs> well, it was a it was a neck and neck race throughout. It, it very much came a two horse race. Uh, it was Fred and Rose West and the John Bonet case. Free horse race. Yeah, you could say that. I'm going to be honest. Tell I us. I wanted to have John Bonet, so I just put on my story to vote for John yeah, Bonet. But he, to be honest, I don't think it made I don't think it made much of a difference, and it was completely within the rules. And uh, there you go. If they wanted Fred and Rose West enough, they could have made fake, account, fake accounts and voted. Yeah, there was a lot of weird like Tom Norris one, Tom Norris two, Tom Norris three accounts that appeared out of nowhere. Um, and uh, as a result, John Bonet, here we are. You gotta be in it to win it, and I was in it twenty six times, and that and that is why we are here. But I, yeah, I am very, keen, I was very keen for this one to win. I think I, I think I said to you beforehand that I thought this one would probably be in the running. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was very keen to do this. It's very different to our usual as well. It's, yeah. it's not. This is the first time on our on our thumbnail for the episode. It won't be a case of this is the killer or this is the the villain of the episode. It's actually the victim because there's no clear well it's not been solved so we don't yeah. know who actually is the person who committed this crime and the beautiful part about this week's uh, episode is that we've got three different perspectives here on the case um that we're going to go into but we're, we're blessed in that dan producer dan hello hello um <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. I just said hello. <laughs> so dan am i right in thinking that you don't know anything about today's case uh, you are correct i know nothing here we go. So I think that's kind of a... Uh, um... And I still know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many documentaries, so many podcasts out there about this case. And I know lots of people have very different theories and... As I said, there's so much to cover here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're condensing it down to an hour-ish kind of episode, so we can't go down every single avenue. Um, but we're going to kind of cover as much as we can as possible. We're going to explain what our theories are. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to come to, you know, who we believe has done it. But we'll look at all the theories, conspiracies. And yeah, we're going to try and cover as much as possible and come to our conclusion, if that is yeah. even possible. But before we get into this, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Give us a like and give us a comment. That'd be very much appreciated. 
As always, thank you so much for telling your friends about us, for supporting us. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to get your hands on some uh, I Could Murder a Podcast merchandise, then why not head over to our store, which is icmap.store. We've got hats, we've got bags, we've got mugs. And we've got bundles. And also, if you're desperate for extra content, we've got a Patreon page with over 20 episodes which you would not have seen in Minnesota on there. So mm. be sure to go over there. Any support there is very much appreciated. And also, we have socials at, at Could Murder a Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So we're going to run through, like we normally do, the background of John Bonet and her family. And then we're going to go to the night in question. So John Bonet, Patricia Ramsey, was born on August 6th, 1990 in Atlanta, Georgia. She was the younger of two children to Patricia Patsy Ramsey uh, and John Bennett Ramsey. Need to make sure I don't get John Bonet and John Bennett mixed up because that is a stumbling block I can see from a distance. And she had an older brother named Burke and John Bonet's first name combines her father's first and middle name um, and her mother's first name was used as her middle name. So that's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. Yeah. John Bonet, Patricia Ramsey. John Bonet was enrolled in kindergarten at High Peaks Elementary School in Boulder, Colorado. So it was a very affluent family like mm-hmm. we seem to be covering a lot recently. Um her father, John, had a very well-paid job, well, well-respected job. They lived in a very large house, a three-story house with a basement. Um, they lived in a very affluent neighborhood. Yeah, so John uh, was a businessman who was the president of Access Graphics, which uh, at the time in the early 90s was worth an estimated $1 billion. John Ramsey had a previous marriage which ended in divorce in 1978, so John's two surviving adult children, uh, a son and a daughter, lived elsewhere. In 1991, John had moved with his second wife and family to Boulder, where the Access Graphics headquarters was located. Um, So John married Patsy when she was 23, and she would be a homemaker and look after Burke and John Bonet. Patsy, when she was a lot younger, she was she was involved in the uh, Miss World scene, the pageant scene. She was Miss West Virginia in 1977, and she'd go on to enter into the uh, Miss America competitions as well. So immediately when you look into this case and you see the pictures, it, you see pictures of John Bonet, very made up, um, often pictures of her in a pageant. Um, this is because, yes, she did enter pageants, and Patsy was there supporting her, and she did. It's been very hinted at in documentaries. Depends which one you watch, but saying that she's living her life through her, yeah. and she's you know she's forced into into the, in these pageants. So from the outside looking in, they're very affluent family, very happy in a Tudor style mansion. John with a very well paid job, um, Patsy very happy as a homemaker. Two wonderful kids, one and one that's been entering pageants, what she used to do, and she was happy to taking taking them to those pageants. Mm-hmm. And yeah, from the outside, it, it you know everything was happy days in terms of the pageant tree obviously it's very big over in america we don't have i don't think there's an equivalent over here but um highly competitive environments as well and not only that but uh, john bonnet was very successful i think of the five or six that she entered she won all six so she was very promising as a um child beauty queen so john bonnet entered various child beauty pageants in boulder where she won titles of america's royal miss little miss child boy little miss colorado Colorado State All-Star Kids Cover Girl and National Tiny Miss Beauty. That's a horrible word. Um, Patsy yeah. was very much made out to be the pageant mother who lived her life through uh, John Bonet, which I, I, I'm going to pick up on that a little bit later on. But um, yeah, from, from the outside looking in, a very happy American family. As Tom said, they had money, they had the house, they had the happy home life. So all appeared to be well in the Ramsey household. While uh, Patsy and John Bonet were off uh, competing, uh, John was at work. He was uh, he was actually named Entrepreneur of the Year in 1996 by the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. So like we said, there's a lot to cover in this case, and we're we're going to go straight into the timeline, and then we're going because we're going to go for the timeline of the night, then dissect all the kind of big bits of evidence from that night. Go through the suspects. It can be slightly different structure to it than we normally do. So it's not so deep dive of the family background at the beginning, but those kind of things will emerge later on. So December 25th, 1996, the Ramses attend a Christmas party at a family friend's house. So John Bonet gets a bike for Christmas and after attending a Christmas party hosted by family friend Fleet White, 
the Ramses go home and John Bonet goes to bed. December 26, 1996, at 2 a.m., neighbor Melody Stanton allegedly hears a scream from the Ramses' home. Her husband then reportedly hears the sound of metal on concrete sometime after the scream. So 5.30 a.m., Patsy Ramsey gets up to make coffee. She discovers a two and a half page handwritten ransom note on the back of the spiral staircase leading to the kitchen that says her daughter has been kidnapped. The note, claiming to be from a small foreign faction, states you will withdraw one... Actually, Ben, I'll stop you here. We want Dan to read this, don't we? We want Dan to read this note here. I'm up for it. And we're going to see... We're going to then pick out bits that we're like, that's a bit odd. Okay. Yeah. I like that, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills, and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attached to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. So immediately, um, the way it's written, small uh, foreign faction is a strange, strange thing to say you are. It seems yeah. to be oddly polite as well in, in spaces. Yeah. So make sure you're well rested. Um, and We respect your business. Yeah. <laughs> Just like we're... Well, it's not on you, but yeah, asking for it's a very specific amount of money. Yeah, and in the which they, in theory, they've targeted. They know about his business, right? Yeah. And it's a business that turns over a billion a year or whatever it is. So they know that he's worth a lot of money. One hundred eighteen thousand in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot of money. So immediately that six hours, that's odd. And also it's a very that number one hundred eighteen thousand, which we'll get we'll get into. Yeah. It feels like there's a reason behind that in particular. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for a proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. But they respect your business as well it's like do particularly like you but they've put a little tiny knot above it speaking to anyone about your situation such as the police or FBI will result in your daughter being beheaded if we catch you talking to a stray dog she dies if you alert bank authorities she dies if the money is any way marked or tampered with she dies you can try to deceive us but be warned, we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try and outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny, as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good, southern common sense of yours. It's up to you now, John. Victory. SBTC. Yeah, so a lot to dissect there. Um, it's a very, like I've seen some documentaries say, it's a, I mean, I think Dan will say as well, it's a very long ransom note. Apparently it's a lot longer than they usually are, but I've heard in other places that they can be very long and thorough. Um, they seem to go in lots of detail um, a thing to point out immediately about this ransom note is it's written on note paper which was found within the house. Yeah. So you could have asked, you could have thought perhaps, oh, it's a long note. They thought about it before coming. They've got it here yep. and they left it there. But no, they've written this whilst being in the household. Um, and as like you know, it's a long it's a long note. So we would have taken some time writing it. Um, so that in itself makes you think that's interesting that they've gone there then written the note. Were they planning to? that to do that all along um some of the language like we said they've kind of very complimentary and odd about john yeah use your you know use your southern common sense and things like that it's very strange um 
worthwhile noting the film Ransom was out a, few, a little while before this and some people think there's some, influ- there's some influence there with the film with Mel Gibson in so yeah immediately there's there's some question marks over this note as to you know what's what's gone through the thinking here what's gone through the mind of the person who's written this note yeah and it's uh, important to mention as well that there was another attempted uh, kidnap uh, ransom note uh, written which it was addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey but then they went ahead and used the Mr. Ramsey one instead so it's kind of an interesting that that one was no, you know not proceeded with so shortly after finding the note, Patsy calls family friends Fleet and Priscilla White, as well as John and Barbara Fernie. The note also said not to call the police. So 22 minutes after first discovering the note and that her daughter is gone, Patsy calls 911. So um, I guess if you're looking at this in, in the cold hard light, cold hard light of day, um, they've said, don't call the police, you do anything like this, we will kill your daughter. So you can look at that and the perspective of they've asked their friends opinions on what they should do they're panicking mm. they've made a call to their friends to come over they're not sure what's the next steps how they should how they should behave yeah so the the white family as well were the family that had hosted them uh, for the christmas party the night before it's f- f- what 5 a.m on uh on boxing okay. day as well so waking them up nice and early um but yeah initially i was like why enough would you not just call you the police straight away but i understand it. again Maybe they're maybe they're initially taking heed of the uh, of the warning not to contact them. Sure. So obviously they've checked the bedroom. John Bonet isn't there, and they're you know very much in panic mode currently. Before six a.m., police officer Rick French arrives at the home and does a search. So he goes through. There's footage of this and photos of the place. Walking around. It's, as we said, it's a ba- there's a basement and three stories above it. So it's a big household to search. He goes through the household. He doesn't find anything. Um, he also is it's important to note that he doesn't tell the. Um, family friends or anyone to leave the property uh, which you know now is apparent it was an apparent crime scene because someone's been kidnapped dna evidence and whatnot is is important here so um he doesn't do anything like that so he doesn't request anyone to leave the property so uh between 6 a.m and 8 a.m four more officers arrive at the ramsey residence and this is policeman veitch policeman weiss and, and policeman Barklow and their supervisor Rickenback. So uh, John Bonet's parents have uh, friends come, you know, friends have come to the house to support them. Um, there's obviously now four additional police officers there. There's also, as well as this, uh, victim advocates and crime scene investigators present in the house. So it's already an incredibly busy scene. And as Tom said, um, they haven't really secured the crime scene yet at this point. So people are kind of coming and going and wandering into different rooms, different parts of the house. It's a very busy scene. Yeah, just to paint that picture, it, there's 18 friends have been called to the house. So it is, it's a lot of people there, police there. They haven't secured the scene. DNA, you know, going around all over the place. Um, the Boulder Police Force weren't equi- equipped to handle this kind of case anyway yeah. from the offset, but they did have a lot of police, um, did have a lot of policemen who were on holiday during this time. And the people who were looking at it at the time were quite junior. They weren't, so it, they didn't really know the best way of dealing with this because. You know, it's, again, with hindsight now, it's easy to look at it and say, why aren't you sending people away? Okay, so it's a very busy scene. And at 8.10 a.m., the first detective arrives on the case, and that is Linda Arndt. Um, so she will come under some scrutiny, but she immediately begins her investigation and fails to secure the crime scene. So at 10.30 a.m., John Ramsey goes missing for at least an hour, leaving the house to supposedly pick up the mail. It is later determined that this couldn't be true given the family's mail was delivered through a slot in the front door. So the interesting part about this is statistically, when a child goes missing, it is, you know, you get in 12 to 1 odds um, that a family member is involved in this situation. So it's such a busy scene and so many people are are panicking and upset and and obviously, um, you know, freaking out over the fact that John Bonet is missing, that John... Ramsey just kind of popping off for an hour goes unnoticed at the time. Yeah, the one thing I will say about this is there's lots of conjecture and different stories depending on where you go for this on different podcasts, on different documentaries. So some things don't might not line up because yeah, it's the Boulder Police Force. We'll get into it. Had a very different opinion to a lot of detectives on this who were brought in from out of, outside from the outside, and they they had a very much a narrative they were trying to fit by. So a lot, a lot of things, it felt like they were trying to make this story sound a certain way. So at 1pm, Detective Linda Arndt tells a resurfaced John Ramsey that police will be conducting a search of the house. Linda Arndt pulls aside John Ramsey and Fleet White, who, who, who had come over to console his friends. Arndt tells them to do a top-to-the-bottom search of the home. 
And this was essentially just to kind of see if there's anything out of order in the house, if anything's missing. Um, so they go straight down to the basement, open up this spare room, which they would refer to as their wine cellar, which ironically was where they would hide the Christmas presents had been hidden. And that's where they go to find John Bernays' lifeless body. It is alleged he screamed before turning the light on. Yeah, so at this point, it was a very dark room. Obviously, it'd be in the basement. It's not just like your typical basement. It's a big, you know, mansion-sized double basement. Um, and uh, allegedly, uh, John, before f flicking the light on, started screaming because he could already see a white towel on the floor, but wasn't, you know, the argument is, how could you define that that is a, a body and how could you also define that that body is deceased before turning the light on? But again, it's all conjecture, as, as Tom said. So 1.05 p.m., John and Fleet discover John Bonet's body in a spare room in the basement. She has suffered a skull fracture and strangulation by garrote. Her mouth and neck are bound with duct tape. John Ramsey immediately rips that off. Um, much of the uh, evidence is tainted at this point um, as John uh, picks his daughter's body up and brings her upstairs. A lot of people after this case would uh, criticise John for... Uh, tampering with the evidence, so to speak, but I've heard interviews of him saying if you were to find your daughter on the floor with that on her face, and there's a thought that she may still be alive, what would you do? I think that's a fair point. It's like you, you've seen your you know, your daughter there lying on the floor, and you picked her up. Obviously, it's not ideal for a crime scene, but you can understand it from a parental point of view that he's gonna he's gonna react. Um, at one thirty p.m., Boulder policeman Ron Walker and, La and Larry Mason arrive and search the basement and wine cellar for further clues into John Bonet's death. When Ron Walker and Larry Mason arrive, they see Patsy holding John Bonet, crying into a holding holding her lifeless daughter. Again, that's tainting the evidence for any kind of DNA as well. And weren't her arms bound as well, but one of the arms was really well tied and the other one was really loosely tied, like yeah. one had a slip knot. And one yeah, had... I think John tried to untie and he struggled to, to get them loose. So, uh, yeah, um, but it's, you know, imagine this horrible scene. They're yeah. just, just it's, it's Boxing Day. Yeah, they found, yeah, if you picture that, Boxing Day, they've just found their lifeless daughter downstairs and you know, the whole their whole life has been turned upside down. Yeah, because up to that point as well, they were obviously preparing to kind of engage with the ransom note and and tr you know try and then launch the search for a daughter. They weren't expecting to find someone that had supposedly been kidnapped within. Well, that's the big thing about this is the writing of the ransom note. Um, even if the thought is, even if the person had killed John Bonet, they take the body because then they're going to make get the money. Yeah. What's the point of writing a ransom note if you're just going to? kill John Bonet and yeah, leave the body and a, there. And a long ransom note of that. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It, it doesn't... Immediately those two things don't add up straight away. It's like, okay, that doesn't make sense. Um, obviously then you go even further, going about the, the writing the ransom note whilst being in the house. All these things are slow, slowly starting to be... What's going on there? So the grot that was found around John Bonet's neck was made up of a rope and a stick, and the stick was actually from a paintbrush from Patsy's stash of art supplies. So again, it's like they haven't got in there with this and yeah. intentionally. And um, that's also a thing that, okay, so now it's a notebook from the family and uh, the garrote's actually made up of stuff that they own themselves. So was, uh, so basically everything so far found at the crime scene and on John Bonet is, is is internal to the building. Um, as well as this, they, they notice uh, on some of the initial uh, search of the house footage that on the kitchen counter there was a large um, torch. Um, which would kind of tally up with the injuries uh, inflicted onto John Bonet's skull. However, when police then return some many days later to collect that as evidence, the, the torch is gone. Yeah, there's, there's. We're gonna, we'll go on to talk about the injuries found on, on John Bonet exactly, um, and then kind of go through the different theories there. Because, as I said, there's lots of different. Uh, theories that go along with this and lots of different ideas of how exactly they, they appeared on her body. So 1.40 p.m. John Ramsey calls his pilot and is allegedly heard asking him to prepare a plane. So uh, John's company owned two private planes um, uh, in order to fly them to their holiday home in Michigan where they plan to see in the new year together. Um, so again that's kind of odd behavior given that you've just found your... So that's the Boulder police that have heard that I yes, believe. Yeah. yeah. So I, I personally have a very strong feeling that the Boulder police have decided quite quickly and early on exactly what they think 
who the perpetrators of this murder are. Okay. And they hear certain things and say certain things to help along with that theory. Um, from seeing interviews with John Ramsey and multiple documentaries and stuff like that, I can't see him planning to do that. No. So it, that seems too perfect for them to kind of go, oh, well, he was planning to do that straight away. Um, people may strongly dis- I think this case is one of those cases where you have a, people have very strong opinions on. That's my personal opinion after watching some documentaries. I think the Boulder Police acted terribly in this and made a lot of mistakes. They decided what the way they thought it was, so then they just stuck to that and didn't yeah. didn't listen to any other evidence. Need to shift the blame quite quickly, didn't they? Well, they wanted to resolve it. Oh, we made a lot of mistakes, but oh, we know the person, people that did it, so let's get it over the line. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's one of those ones where I'm like that, and even him leaving the house, I think. Well, that, as, as well as that, when they arrive and and uh, Patsy's obviously grieving over her daughter's lifeless body, like dis- obviously it's an overwhelmingly upsetting situation but even so they shouldn't have allowed her to get that close no, to the daughter's no. body whatsoever they shouldn't have they, you, this is a big point like you said it's 12 to 1 the family are involved with this kind of thing right so then you don't ask someone who is potentially a guilty party to look around the house yeah yeah. leave them by unassisted. Yeah, unassisted to go and if they wanted to hide any evidence do anything like that, or even even give it legs and just run. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't leave them unassisted to go around a crime scene. But it's then they're very rich, uh, they're very affluent. It's a big house. Uh, maybe they maybe they genuinely needed more more uh, resource there. Yeah, but you just have, you, obviously we've watched a million crime documentaries, and, and I think everyone nowadays knows the kind of basic thing is you clear the area, you don't let anyone touch anything. If people are wearing, any people out in wear wearing gloves or wearing like, yeah, has and they did the the absolute opposite yeah. of all of these. Exactly. Yeah, they had eighteen them. friends over which they let stay around kind of just breathing walking around touching things and then they had yeah, the, the, as I said the father picking up his, his dead daughter that is something you can be like okay he shouldn't have done that but at the same time how would you react so it's like, like and then okay that's one thing you bring her upstairs and then you be like okay can you put her down don't touch her anymore you'd say that clearly but then Patsy you know as, again a mother seeing the daughter you, how are you going to react but yeah these kind of things lots of clear mistakes by them the Boulder County don't, didn't they didn't have a homicide team so none of them were trained with dealing with this they, mm-hmm. they weren't even trained really for this kind of scene whatsoever which then you can understand that they're overwhelmed by it and they're not sure not sure how to act by it but at the same yeah. time it's like there must be some like co- common sense <laughs> yeah I, I don't know, it's easy for me to say from this perspective well let me, let me play uh devil's advocate then so play it this could just be more uh kind of uh spinning from uh the the boulder police but if he if he if john has john ramsey has found his his daughter's body in the basement and immediately decided to pick her up and carry her upstairs into another room where the rest of the family are at no point was he observed trying to carry out any kind of cpr it is alleged he immediately rips the the duct tape from her, so he's he's already he's almost already aware that she's dead, without performing any kind of resuscitation or CPR. I, I find it from all the interviews he gave as well. John John Ramsey was one of the few that I was like, no, he's fine, not fine, but he's you know he's I don't have too much suspicion around him. But then the way they have span it, and that point in particular stayed with me. If that is the case, he's not tried any kind of CPR. He's not tried to resuscitate. Um, but then, you know, we're just going off of information that's available. So, yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's, it's a tricky one because, as we said, it, you, we're hearing this from a lot of mishmash of different information yeah. f- from it all. So, two thirty p.m. Police conduct an interview with John Bonet's brother Burke, which which reveals the nine-year-old allegedly slept through the events of the previous night. At some point after this, his father is advised to procure an attorney, which he does by hiring friend Mike. Burnham. So in one of the uh, CB, the big CBS documentaries, they do, uh, and you'll like this, Dan. They do, um, they do some audio analysis of that 911 call because after Patsy allegedly put the phone down, there's still like six seconds of audio available, and they do all sorts of magic stuff with this audio, Dan, and eventually come to the point where they can hear three, uh, two other people as well as Patsy in the background, which is they allege to have been John and Burke. But it's even in the amount of work they did with it, I still couldn't hear exactly what the and, and they try the whole Mandela effect by putting the subtitles yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's one of the you know when you have those like ghost shows and they go, oh, you can hear it. Yeah. Like, when well, you can't hear it at all. They? Yeah, it's like they very much trying to like 
if you want to hear things from certain things, you, you can definitely get that. And there were, there's a lot of documentaries that, who are, are very keen to try and point the fingers here at the family, which I can understand. But it's, yeah, I, I wasn't really buying that. So within the last six seconds, once that audio is enhanced, it is alleged that you can hear Mr. Ramsey saying, we're not speaking to you, before Patsy Ramsey allegedly asks, what did you do? Help me, Jesus. Uh, before finally Burke can allegedly be heard saying, what did you find? Um, again, this would, would go on to contradict an eventual statement given by Patsy. The only thing I could really hear clearly was, help me, Jesus, from Patsy. Um, I think the rest Which is, that would make sense in the situation. Yeah, yeah, of course. So they allege that they can hear a, uh, a, a low-pitched male voice that they associate with John Ramsey and a high-pitched male voice uh, that they associate with Burke Ramsey. So uh, 10.45 p.m., the Boulder County coroner's team removed John Bonet's uh, body from the house. So December 28th, 1996, the Ramses cooperate with the authorities. The family goes to the Boulder police station and they willingly give hair, blood and handwriting samples. So obviously they're given the handwriting samples to match up against the ransom note just to check and see if there's any kind of um, similarities there. Um, the police would then later state that John Ramsey's grown children from a previous marriage, uh, John Andrew Ramsey and Melinda Ramsey, were out of town when the murder occurred, so are not considered suspects. Okay, so that's the timeline of the night, how it occurred to, and it's been reported on. That's exactly the kind of moments for the family, from the family's perspective of what's happened throughout the night. They've woken up, they found this note, and then they um, they get the friends over, they call the police, the police say to search the house, and then they find their lifeless daughter in the basement downstairs. Yeah, and the two obviously massive uh, pieces of evidence uh, that will will continue to feature here are first of all the 911 call, but then obviously the uh, the ransom note itself. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, there's there's conjecture at all angles. So obviously our timeline is very focused on statements from uh, the Boulder Police uh, Department, but then also uh, friends of the family that were there on the day. So we've tried to kind of keep that balance. Yeah, because I'm going to be completely like, but I knew about this case from years and years and years ago, watching documentaries on it. Um, and, you know, obviously doing this for doing this case, we've done more research in it. We've watched more things, the things that have emerged, newer documentaries, newer podcasts. And then I remember watching it the first time round, and I was very much, it's the family, they've done something, it's all to do with them. Then one of the documentaries I watched before watching this, uh, before before filming this, it completely changed my opinion on the case. Okay. So even kind of going through that timeline there, there's things that really irked me because I believe that's that's the story that was fed to the press and the media um, to try and paint the family in a certain way. Um Mainly because there's, there's a documentary I watch, which is all based around a guy called Lou Smith, who was a detective uh, who was brought into the case. He sold you know, in his career, had a 30 year career, arrested 200 people, all with a 100 percent conviction rate. He solved a very, he basically solved another very similar case, which was the murder of Heather Church. Arrested that person. He found that person, arrested them, and then they they admitted to I think it was around 40. Or it was it was a, they admit to another large amount of murders as well. Um, he's like the kind of... You couldn't ask for a better person no, to be involved. Exactly. And he, he's, he's very much... His methodology was very much mo what's the motive? What's the character? And like, what's their character like? And then what's the evidence? Mm. Um, so he went into this, you know, with a fresh kind of eyes, a lot more experience than the Boulder police. And I watched this documentary and it went through all his kind of his thoughts on it, the evidence he managed to get, which we're going to go through... And then I was like, there's no, it, it, it couldn't have been, in my head, it, I basically left that with a completely different idea. So we're going to go through all that now and kind of explain, I'm going to explain to you what things he's done that's made me think that way. The body's been found. We're going to talk about some of the injuries found from the coroner and whatnot afterwards. Um, so there was, yeah, there was a significant uh, blow of a blunt object to the head. There's a strangulation marked around the neck from the garrote. There's signs to hint there's possibly sexual abuse as well that was committed. Um, so those are the kind of the key things originally, which were kind of said from the coroners and whatnot. Um, Lou Smith would very early on um, would notice while looking at the kind of pictures from the coroners, he noticed these two marks on on JonBenet's neck. Um, there was a photo taken the day before, obviously Christmas time, um, which he compared them to, um, and the, these marks weren't on the neck beforehand. And there are two little dots on the neck, like two like little for, vampire bite. Yeah, 
yeah, like a little vampire bite, I guess. Like two little small dots. And he at first was trying to wonder what that possibly could be. He then thought perhaps it's a stun gun. Um, so he looked into that. He got he got the measurements and he basically could find stun guns, which were essentially were the same size. And what's the reason why someone used a stun gun here? It's because obviously they're taking someone from their bedroom. Don't want them making a noise. And if they're kidnapping them, they want them you know, to go as quietly as possible. So it does all link in and it does make some sense. So he's basically saw this. He's linked that straight away. The um, Boulder police were very quick to say that there was no sign of an intruder. Yeah. And that's the thing they stuck by. They would say there's no signs of an intruder. There's no way they possibly could have got into the um, basement the other way. So there's, looking at it, there's, there's a broken window at the basement. Yeah. Which John Ramsey said he he admitted to he broke that window if, uh, a little while previously because he's locked out. He smashed the window to get in. The Boulder police said it was too small for anyone to climb through. Lou Smith, apparently this he was very like this. He gave it. He literally climbed through the window himself. Showed how easy it was to climb through. Um, and he basically also noted from the kind of pictures of the evidence that there was a suitcase in front of the window. There was a mark on the wall to suggest that someone's climbing through the window. They would leave a mark on the wall, and they used the suitcase in order to get out. So he was very much straight away. This looks like it's definitely an intruder has been into this household. So Lou Smith's perspective here is intruder boulder's perspective is family and this is a thing that they're going to be dancing with these two ideas for a very long time and neither are willing to budge yeah um well the okay yeah because i I got an argument for the window part go on um so there's a there was a, a large spider's web found in the corner of that particular window and there was no from a separate documentary, and again, this is all conjecture, but from this particular uh, documentary, the, the lady could get in and out, and she was a strong lady lifting herself up without aid of that suitcase, but she couldn't get in and out without disturbing that particular spider's web, which they did various tests on and were able to basically conclude that if an intruder had got in or out, then that spider's web would not have been there. But again, it's a, it's a spider's web. Yeah, there's lots of things in this that seem to contradict one another. Going on from you know the, the window point we were, we were making, there was a mark on the floor of a high tech boot print. High and tech, the, and those boots weren't found anywhere within the household. Um, so yeah, so basically, Lucy Smith come in, has come into this case. He's found these bits of evidence, like the, the print, the mark on the wall, the suitcase against the wall, and um, he's very much under under that idea. Another thing that was heavily reported on a lot of the documentaries and podcasts I heard was the idea that she had been blow, hit on the head and then she would be made to look like she'd been strangled. Okay, yeah. Yeah. To kind of like the idea that possibly um, a family member accidentally hit her on the head and then to make it look like, oh no, because that's obvious, whatever, we'll make it look like it was a strangulation. Yeah, they had to try to muddy the waters and try and... Though the thing discounting that was there was foreign DNA found under John Bonet's fingernails, and um, like there's marks on her neck, obviously where she was looking to pull off the garrote from her neck as well. Mm-hmm. So she wasn't killed. Ki- yeah, she was. Yeah. it was basically she'd been killed by the garrote and then smacked in the head afterwards. Is 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 the actual thoughts there, which kind of contradicts a lot of people's theories immediately lots of suspects in this and we're going to go through the kind of clear ones that were mentioned um throughout the documentaries we watched uh, so we're going to start off with going through the family first and then we'll we'll move on to that okay. to the other. so so basically the parents um of course people they were immediately and they, they were suspicious and these were the reasons why they were suspecting them calling 18 friends into the house muddying up the crime scene trying to make it you know hard for the police to to find it John picking up the body removing the tape and contaminating the crime scene again basically if John did do it the policewoman saying go have a search he thought oh great I can literally yeah. get my DNA all over this crime scene <laughs> and no one's gonna, you know well that's my point as well no, no, not that I think it was John but at no point had any of the police kind of gone I mean if, it, if, it, if you imagine if it was the parents and they're sat there while police are searching the house and you're like no one's going under the fucking basement and then they give him permission to search. He's straight down there. The grot that was found around John Bonet's neck was made of the rope and the stick. The stick was actually a bit of paintbrush from Patsy's art supplies, again, linking the weapon to her. Um, the parents had separate attorneys after the case. That was one that got a lot of, a lot of people talking, thinking that maybe there wasn't some agreement there, because, you know, you'd imagine probably have one attorney representing both of them. Um, 
there's this theory which I can disprove quite quickly from things I've heard, which was John Bonet had also had a problem with regularly wetting the bed. Some people suggested that Patsy might have killed her in a rage over bed wetting, while others are. Um, while, while it's also been pointed out that bedwetting can also be a symptom of sexual abuse. Yeah, and then there was also links to some of the um, some of the uh, what was the word condition of John Bonet's. Um, groin area at the time and that is that um, it, was, it was very swollen um, and this could also link to a very tired Patsy Ramsey having woken up, found that she'd wet the bed um, quite aggressively kind of drying the area and putting talcum powder over it and there being some sort of reaction. The only thing was the bed sheets themselves which were completely clean mm. on that night. Interesting. Now the bed sheets were found to be soiled anyway so like that theory for that particular thing mm. so, yeah the sexual abuse thing like we said that there were signs so that's all you know that's poss- a possibility there um, <clears throat> in in A Mother Gone Bad the hidden confession of John Bonet's killer a psychologist Andrew Andrew G. Hodges argues that one possibility in the murder is that Patsy Ramsey caught her husband molesting John Bonet and hit her in a fit of rage then they staged the kidnap and a murder scene together to cover the whole thing up that's quite elaborate. It sounds very elaborate, yeah. And being uh, angry at, at John Bonet rather than John. Yeah, that is, yeah. So, that's my husband. <laughs> there were fibres detected on the duct tape that was used to cover John Bonet's mouth and nose, and those fibres were found to be consistent with that found on Patsy's clothing. A lot of people said it took ages for the, for the Ramses to talk to the police and give anything, and give, you know, they were very like talking to attorneys and talk, going on, on the TV on before. CNN before. But they... apparently, they gave their interviews quickly and they gave the even DNA samples quickly and they, they gave hand runs samples very quickly. So, again, it's literally who you ask in this case in terms of, of, of who to believe. But, um, and also, my other thing would be with the stun gun thing why would the parents stun gun their child? Because they, you know, the other idea is someone coaxed. John Bonet out of the bedroom, took her to the basement, and then killed her downstairs. Which is terrifying. Which any parent could have done. They didn't need a stun gun in order to, in order to do that. They they already have the trust. So that's that's the kind of the big things for me. Oh, and obviously there's things with the ransom letter, like the the um, the paper. Um, some of the handwriting experts would say there's a slight link between some of Patsy's writing as well. Yeah, the old left hand trick. Yeah. So the note in itself is is, is an absolute enigma in terms yeah. of you know if even if it were. If it was an intruder, them leaving the body behind, it's all very, very odd. And then there's a theory about the brother. The theory is that Burke had killed his sister by accident, perhaps by accidentally hitting her on the head with something heavy or hitting her in anger. And then the parents finding, you know, the body and then writing up this elaborate note, taking the body downstairs. That's, is, that's, is that the one that you're... There's part of that that I'm, yeah, warming to. Burke is, you know... We don't want any kind of lawsuit, but Burke is where my finger is pointing. <laughs> there are rumours which Burke denies that Burke had smeared feces on the wall of his sister's room and in her bed. Remnants of his work were found in the bathroom and even John Bonet's bedroom, a discovery that led some to believe that he resented his sister and was behind her murder. When Burke was brought in for questioning 13 days after the murder, he told the psychologist and police that his mother was going psycho looking for John Bonet and that she was overreacting. He seemed happy and carefree the whole time and joked about being too busy playing video games to worry about his sister. The, those wounds I mentioned earlier were consistent with the edges of one of Burke's toys, which is train tracks. Um, so the, the thought is there that he kind of like jabbed her with one of those, yeah. um, which you would really have to do that quite hard to make them the marks that they were. Yeah, see that one. I kind of I remember my brother hit me with m- many different things as a boy, <laughs> and uh, I remember a uh, railway ticket. Him scratching my face with one. Like it was quite a sharp ticket. Anything he could use as a weapon. Mm. Um, the other theory here, Ben, which we haven't touched upon is the pineapple theory. Yeah. The autopsy revealed that John Bonet had chunks of pineapple in her stomach when she died and they were undigested, so she only had, only had them in her system for a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, both the parents denied giving her any pineapple. There was a bowl of pineapple in the kitchen. Yeah, so it was uh, a, a meal that uh, Burke would previously uh, regularly have before bed. He would have chunks of pineapple and I believe uh, a glass of milk. I think that was also there. So Burke's here, fingerprints were discovered on it. And some yeah. people think that it's possible that an argument over the pineapple caused Burke to attack John Bonet. Mm-hmm. So that's the theory there for Burke. There's those theories there. Do you have any more you wanted to add, Ben? So one, one of the knots on um, John Bonet's left, I believe it was her left wrist, was, was a slip knot. And uh, Burke had been practicing those in recent weeks. Uh, 
building up to uh, Christmas. So he'd been evidence that he was able to tie that particular knot. It was really shoddily done. Um, but there was also a very... T- they weren't the closest brother and sister, and there was uh, potentially a lot of animosity over the fact that uh, John Bonnet was the, the prize child, obviously carrying the father's first and second name, as yep. well as the mother's uh, first name as a middle name. So, yeah, a lot of envy, apparently, between the two. I often would fight, as siblings do, but po- poking with a train track. So that's the Burke idea. And then we'll move on to... Santa Bill. So um, this other suspect here, which Bill McReynolds. So one suspect was a man who was dressed as Santa Claus. He would play Santa at their Christmas parties. Um, he was basically a family friend. Burke and John Bonet loved him, obviously, because it's, it's Santa. Is your party? Of course, you're gonna love him. John Bonet actually took him on a tour of the household, showing him the basement. He had left a note for John Bonet saying something special will happen to you after Christmas. Which is all is all very bizarre. I fall on the murder. He went to, to get. He loved the public attention. He went on the stay show saying they adopted me as a member of the family. We don't celebrate children enough. It's all just kind of a bit seedy, horrible stuff. He took. He had a vial of, of glitter that was given to him by John Bonet, and he took it with him into heart surgery as a good luck token. And he asked his wife to mix his ashes with a vial of glitter, which I find quite unner- unnerving. Mm-hmm. So the thought here is perhaps, okay, you know, he knew the household, he knew the layout of the house. If Santa Claus is going into your bedroom at night, you, he can quite, you'd trust him, you'd follow him, you know, especially around Christmas time. Well, that's it. When you made the point of someone coaxing her out of the room to the basement, not being, I, I assume that you meant that from the intent, from the perspective of an intruder, and that's what creeps me out. Yeah, the, yeah, that's the, that's that's the thought, yeah. I mean, to get to get John Bonet from her bedroom downstairs... Quietly. It, quietly with someone she trusts. That's the thought. Or watch the sun gun. Um, did Santa sneak in, feed a pineapple, because you know, he trusted him? Um, but his alibi was he was at home with his family and he slept through the whole night and he lived an hour and a half away and his family confirmed that. Um, <clears throat> he also had recently had lung surgery, which made him fairly frail and, and unable to do physical activity, like, you know, the idea of carrying her downstairs and actually taking up, taking on the attack. And the DNA um, excluded him from the case. So I think it's fairly conclusive that you know, he isn't actually the person that committed the crime, um, but he was very much one of the suspects at the time. Yeah, and interestingly, on uh, Boxing Day of 1974, which was 22 years before John Bonet was reported kidnapped, uh, the nine-year-old daughter of Janet and Bill McReynolds was kidnapped, oh. which is a bit spooky. It's very spooky. Did she come back? So Bill's daughter and a friend were taken to an unknown location where they were forced to watch um, their friend being sexually molested. Both children were then released. Um, Two years later, Janet McReynolds, uh, Bill's wife, wrote a book about it, which actually went on to become a play. So yeah, he's been very much kind of ruled out from this. Then we move on to The Drifter, Gary Olivia. So um, there's a guy called Gary Olivia who was a known sex offender who lived near John Bonet. So he lived, um, there was 10 houses down from the Ramsey household. There was a homeless shelter slash church set up and he was staying there around the time. He was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Apparently on the night of the murder, he called a friend up claiming that he'd hurt a little girl. Strangely, he was also found with the same stun gun marks on his body that John Bonet had. Mm. Or Burke with a train track. So the convicted paedophile had been living in the area on and off when police allegedly found a magazine cutout of John Bonet Ramsey in his backpack, along with a copy of a poem he had written called Ode to John Bonet, after he was apprehended on drug charges in the year 2000. His friend in In Touch magazine revealed that he was particularly unsettled by how the knots used to fashion the garrote that strangled John Bonet were similar to those he had once used in an incident where Gary had attempted to choke his mother with a telephone cord. So apparently the knots on the garrote were very similar to the ones he used mm-hmm. before. Um, he openly admitted to the police how he was obsessed with John Bonet, how he had dreams about her. I mean, he made a shrine of her at his own home and he put her face on Monopoly money. Oh, that's creepy. That's, that's, that's creepy. Very bizarre. He said he couldn't have hurt her. I loved her too much. He would look at her photo and it would make him cry. Um, and he actually had a stun gun himself. It was given to, by a friend for protection. And this is one of the big things for me was he showed up at the vigil 
um, when they, you know, there were a small vigil. Apparently, it's really cold night, not, not a lot of people showed up, but he was there the night of the vigil as well. And you know, that's a big thing where if you commit the crime, yeah, returning to returning to seeing the crime and kind of you know, seeing your handiwork, so to speak. Mm. So he was very much, you know, when I was, just, I was like, oh, it must be Gary. I was watching that, and then, but the DNA did not match. So <laughs> it's so bizarre. Those two, there's two people clearly like around the area uh, odd links yeah and the other thing I just wanted to point out was so um, in the Ramsey neighbourhood um, so the Ramsey neighbourhood was home to 38 registered sex offenders also in the months leading up to the murder over 100 burglaries reportedly took place in the general vicinity of the Ramsey neighbourhood that's a lot that's high we've got the mother the father the brother the drifter the Santa we now arrive at the housekeeper and we've got the electrician. What do you want? Do you want the teacher, the housekeeper, or the electrician, Ben? We've let's go. For, let's let's bring a female into it. Let's go for the housekeeper. It's a male. You pig. No, I'm joking. This is... Before we get onto the housekeeper, um, one thing to note here was that the the figure that was mentioned in the um, the ransom letter of 118,000 that has been requested was actually the exact amount John had received as a holiday bonus. That's a big bonus. That is, yeah. But that's a very specific number. And that kind of... Surely, so if someone's asking for that money, they must know that he must have received that money as a holiday bonus. And so you could, you could argue that it could be the family, or you could argue yeah. that it could be someone working in the house, Ben. Mm-hmm. Someone with ears to the ground. Yeah. Like a mouse. Yeah. No that brings us to our... <laughs> Stuart Little. The snidey little c***. Um... <clears throat> All right, so the housekeeper. This is the, this is the other theory here. So someone that John Bonet would have trusted when she when she saw her, so leading her downstairs, it wouldn't have been crazy. Thinking, you know, someone that she's seen from the household it's before. The housekeeper, exactly, exactly. Two a.m., three a.m., four a.m., whatever. You know, that's still early. <laughs> and still early. She's a hard worker, and yeah. also she could well have possibly seen the pay stub um, knocking around the house. Bit bit arrogant, him leaving it out there for everyone to see. <laughs> um, the the theory of the the, the intruding and, and coming in. So basically, um, looking at it, they, they, they assert that she needed the money. She asked for some more money from from Ramsey, um, and he actually declined, giving her an extra bump of money. And the thought is that you know she was upset by this that she led on to do this in order to get some more money out of her. She, also, her alibi didn't really stack up because her husband allegedly slept on the couch, so he wasn't able to say that she definitely was at home. Mm. But, um, Other than that, I think of all of them so far, she's the biggest stre- stretch. Yeah, I mean, all the documentaries I really watched on it didn't really have her pinned down as one of the one of the possibilities here. But the final two, Ben, I've left because I think these two, for me, well, I'll go I'll go through the one that stands out the most, and yeah. So John Mark Carr, mm. aka the teacher. There's a journalist who was looking into this case called Michael Tracy, and he began to receive emails from a name called Daxis, spelled like taxis with a D, um, saying he knew about the crime. So Michael Tracy at first kind of just parred it off, not thinking it was anything in particular. You know, then he kept getting these emails. He got even one of them even included a love poem about John Bonet, which is horrible. And he was trying to say, could you, sh- could you send this to Patsy? Can you show it to her? He again was like, this is, uh, you know, I don't want to, follows yeah. up on this and I mean even just looking at this uh, John Mark Carr he is a creepy spooky I've looking got, I've got a great lookalike for him <laughs> but he's just a very even before you talk about the way this guy acts and the way this guy behaves he's just peculiar what, the picture you'll get from what this stuff I have to say is exactly how he looks yeah yes yeah um, so he began becoming very detailed about the crime showing lots of knowledge which this is what immediately made Michael Tracy the journalist actually be like okay this might be something worth looking into. So he admits over email that he's a paedophile, says that his favourite age is, was the age of six, which is the age that John Bonet was. Um, he goes on to say that she died in his arms, saying that he had sex with her and it was erotic asphyxiation. Um, he said the, th- weird th- the things he knew which really stood out was he knew that she was wearing a bracelet, which he could say, you know, a little girl wearing a bracelet is nothing to be, um, you know, that's nothing... You know, anyone could guess that possibly, um, but she knew that she was found in underwear with the words Wednesday on. So it's a very specific bit of information that he knew. And when he mentioned that, that really stood out to the journalist and he, he kind of followed it up. He wanted to communicate with Patsy Ramsey and he wanted to send her a message. So obviously Michael spoke to the, Pat, the to the Ramseys and kind of, you know, this, this could be a way to find out who killed your daughter, um, communicating with them and, um, 
they were like, okay, they, you know, we, we will um, participate within this. So um, he gave them the phone number, but he got cold feet and he didn't actually make the call. So Michael Tracy called him and re- he recorded the phone call. And it's, it's horrifying to listen to. He says he kissed her on the lips and he wanted her so much. And he came out this, this heated, passionate trance. And when he came out, he found out she was dead. The police traced this call to Bangkok, Thailand. So um, he was a 41-year-old American citizen, married twice. The first time he was married was to a 13-year-old child. Yeah, in Alabama in, uh, in 1984, when he was 19 at the time. So, yeah, age of consent. So his name was John Mark Carr, and he also taught at grade school. Um, he had child porn charges, and he fled the country to go to Bangkok. So, yeah, he so he said he's saying all these things. Basically, Bangkok extradite him, send him back over to the to America. He he, he seems to be kind of loving the attention mm-hmm. from the media. However, the um, DNA evidence proves Carr was never at the crime scene, and he also said that he drugged Ramsey, but there's no drugs found in the system. So his story didn't at all make sense within the crime scene whatsoever. So it's just been said that he just completely lied about the whole thing I mean the question is why do you lie about it uh, apparently hundreds of people lie about coming forward for crimes for especially high profile ones for the notoriety yeah and in terms of knowing the, the, that information apparently uh, well there's a lot of things you know there's different ways you could look into things and perhaps there was things mentioned in the press that he just grabbed a hold, hold of these niche bits of information and spun it in his own way which put him like in the forefront like the Boulder police exactly Carr would also uh, later send other emails under numerous pen names, including Daxis the Conqueror. Um, It looks like Dark Pawns, but DRK space PRNZ and Alexis. Um, Carr would later change his legal name to Alexis Valeron Reich, claiming to be a transgender woman. However, this was denied by Samantha Spiegel, who had uh, who was in a kind of a, a court battle with him and actually obtained an, a restraining order from him. Um, basically alleged that the only reason Carr wanted to undergo a gender reassignment surgery was to be able to get closer to younger girls and also to get into a child sex cult called the Immaculates. Wow. Yeah. Which is just a bizarre little tangent there on Carr. But he's spooky as hell looking. If it if it is the intruder um, narrative and he's the uh, he's the leading man, that uh, any possible image of seeing him at night taking you down to the basement is absolutely haunting. And now we're down to the electrician, Michael Helgoff. So another, he was he worked in a nearby auto salvage yard, um, and he had been referred to as a hellraiser. And he was tied in, he was tied to an alleged property dispute involving the Ramses. Could that have served as possible motivation to seek revenge on the family and kid, kidnap John Bonet? A little bit about his past, because. Uh, Based on the documentary I watched, it was someone who lived on, on, the, on the land where he lived as well, and um, a friend of his, and he kind of would detail the kind of things he used to do and things that um, he made him believe that he was the person who killed John Bonet. He used to shoot cats, torture animals. Um, he had been he had been caught sexually assaulting a child before. His girlfriend actually caught him in bed with their child, and he said, that, "You know, I can't I can't control my um, urges." His, his former co-worker said in late November Helgarth had told me that he and a partner were going to have a great deal were going to make a great deal at Christmas and they were going to each bring in around 50 or 60 thousand each and then he said this afterwards I, I, I will never forget we were walking toward the house and he said I wonder what it would be like to crack a human skull I thought it was a very odd thing to say so you think 50 or 60 thousand together what's that 110 thousand so 118 thousand it's not too crazy to link those two there so um after Christmas, when he saw his co-worker, he said the deal went wrong and no money was made. Then he would go on to actually kill himself two days after the, the uh, press conference from the Boulder DA. When they said there was zero, zero and in on one new suspect, he, he, he had committed suicide. So when they went to go in, when when the police went to go and you know obviously follow the report about the suicide and, and, and check the crime scene, there was high tech boots in his house. Um, the suicide, I say in, in inverted commas, is. He, he shot himself for a pillow. Um, and he was right-handed, but it was, on from, from, it was shot from the left. So it's suspected. You know, he says that like, him and a partner were going to do the crime together. Yeah. Um, he, if you're shooting someone for a pillow, it's to stop them screaming. Yeah. 
Yeah. Also, sometimes in movies, act like I don't think this is realistic. I think this is Hollywood silence. Silence, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> exactly. So why would he want to stifle that? That anyway. Uh, he had a stun gun in his house. The same measurements found. Um, and apparently, he was like the way he acted and the way he was. I know a lot of suicides. People aren't expecting not uh, expecting them to commit suicide. So it's not very a fair thing to say. Well, he was you know a happy person, but. Um, it's all very two days afterwards he's going to make that money high tech boots the stun gun he killing animals uh, known to ha- you know, sexually assault a child before an altercation with the Ramses. for me personally this is where I uh, I was kind of I'm honing in on um, but Boulder Police apparently said the boots did not match though Lou Smith and his team were saying why didn't it match? What's the thing? Can you tell us? And they never told them why it didn't match. Why they didn't match. A lot of times throughout all this case, Lou Smith and his team want to know certain answers and Boulder Police are like, oh no, we're ignoring the evidence. They, they didn't take mm. really notice of the stun gun either. Yeah, so that's basically, they're the, they're the suspects from this case. They're the well, the ones that we know of. Um, they actually were, um, this, this is an absolutely bizarre figure. Apparently 98% of the tips that Boulder Police got weren't even called back. Wow. I know uh, the, apparently the media investigations identified over uh, 1,600 suspects in the case. Mm. But I know all the time with these kind of cases, especially high profile cases, people maybe trying to be helpful or maybe trying to get the reward because there was a reward put up there as well for any help for the capture. Yeah. So they're just saying anything. Um, but at the same time, 98% not being looked into is yeah. is a very high number. We had quite a big pop at the uh, the Yorkshire Ripper investigation squad, but I mean, they were trying. Yeah, they were trying. Well, they interviewed him like <laughs> seven <laughs> times or whatever. Yeah. Not trying hard enough, but they were trying. <laughs> um, and interestingly, you know, the reward money that you mentioned as well, I think it was 100,000, but half of that was being fronted by the Ramses at the time. Yeah. So... John only wanted to give a part of his Christmas bonus, but uh, we're not pointing fingers at John. But so that's that's the kind of the outline in terms of these are the people are suspected as well. Uh, the other the other thing to kind of note throughout this, which is it's just very sad and like it do, uh, again, it depends on side side of the fence you are in terms of who you th- who you think done this. Throughout all of this, um, Patsy was suffering with, with cancer. Um, she was at a younger age as well. She she got it as a very young age and raised in John Bonet, like kind of her. Pride and Joy was going to these pageants, spending time with her daughter during the time when she was recovering. But she was portrayed by the media as being just evil. Yeah. And and like John says, you know, that's the saddest thing in this thing for him. He said she was a great mother. Um, sadly, she would pass away. Um, she passed away before the parents were actually cleared, which we'll get to. Um, she would pass away before the family were completely cleared of murder. Yeah, so I mean, it's what are we in now? So it's kind of 28 years on and there's still no no clear answer as to what happened or who was responsible but for the first kind of five ten years in particular they remained kind of at the forefront of the prime suspects yeah so as you said there's so much to this case and we can't go through every single angle of it so some of it we are kind of having to go over quite quickly but um lou smith would um, actually retire from from duty because he he was like if police are standing in, in the way of actual evidence, I can no longer do this job, which he felt like the Boulder police were doing. Um, he he would testify as a witness in the case against the the, the um, against the Ramses, and apparently his testimony really helped them, you know, be proved not guilty. There was enough evidence for them, on them anyway. So in 1999, according to the previously sealed court documents reported on CNN, a grand jury wanted to indict both Ramsey parents on identical charges of child abuse resulting in death and being accessories to a crime. Um, but apparently it was said there was insufficient evidence, so the Ramseys weren't charged. And apparently at that time, it was, uh, you know, people thought that was 100% going to happen. Um, but Lou Smith's evidence as well as a witness... Um, he came forward, and you know they were they were they were cleared then. But um, oh, so they weren't found guilty then, and the entire Ramsey family were cleared of the murder of John Bonet in two thousand and eight. And sadly, that was um, Patsy had actually passed away before that was actually announced. So she, yeah. her name was never cleared while she was still there, which is very sad. Like I said, <laughs> there's so many layers. To this. this is yeah. like this is like an onion lasagna. There's that many layers, Ben. Absolutely, uh, on top of another onion lasagna. Let me just use my metaphor twice, but it, it, yeah. Is that kind On of On a case. wedding cake. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. In a wedding cake supermarket. I've got a couple of things that I just need to clear a couple of things up as well. So the, the, there was, um, there was found, a drop of blood was found in the underwear. Um, 
and some signs that she may have suffered sexual abuse in the past we mentioned but her mother had taken her to the doctor for vaginal vaginal irritation in the past but claimed it was from a bubble bath and um her vaginal opening was also twice the size of that of a normal six-year-old girl according to some investigations that didn't happen from only one night of abuse Wow. So that would lead more and more toward the parents. There's so many layers to this. Yeah. In the timeline we mentioned, there was the scream that the neighbour heard. Yes. And then yeah. that was speculated when, well, surely that would wake your parents, the parents up. Of course, But yeah. our boy, Lou Smith, my boy, Lou Smith, did tests on that. And essentially there was a pipe within the um, within the garage, which went out from, through the, sorry, from the garage, from the basement. The pipe from the basement went out through the wall leading out to the outside. So the screaming we actually went could go through that pipe and go out like a kind of megaphone. Okay. And John Bonet's parents were on the it wasn't just the, you know, second floor up, it was three floors yeah. up in the master bedroom. So they did tests and had audio engineers, don't you like that? Audio net audio engine <laughs> engineers um upstairs testing that and people in, up over at the neighbor's house across the street to test if someone was screaming down there if you could hear them. And apparently the neighbours could hear it, but the parents couldn't hear it from upstairs. Yeah. So that kind of, and, the, and the sound of concrete <clears throat> on the floor was the same sound as the grate that was blocking the window to the basement. When they close that, oh, it's the okay. same kind of clang sound. Yeah, so I, I haven't watched the documentary that Tom's um, referencing with this uh, Smith, and I, I'm liking the sound of Smith already, but he, he was backed up by former FBI agent John E. Douglas, who was uh, one of the prime uh, characters based on uh, the mind, the excellent Mindhunter series. We love it. We, 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 we bloody love We're it. We're hoping Series 3 does actually come back. Yeah, um, not looking too fabulous at the moment, but who knows. But Johnny Douglas backed uh, and supported Smith's various theories. Um, for me, I uh, personally believe, although this came under a lot of criticism, so there was the CBS uh, documentary, which essentially kind of points fingers at Burke. Um, and there would be a subsequent lawsuit from uh, Burke's defense team regarding this. But essentially, it's the idea that... Um, First of all, if there was a um, an invader, or a, not an invader, sorry, a, an intruder, intruder um, or if it was someone genuinely wanting to obtain ransom money, um, then why was she killed? Yeah. So that's the first question. I mean, if her death was accidental, then why still leave the ransom note? Yes, that's very true. And also the suitcase was believed to be the one that was used to kind of get out of that window. Accordingly, apparently the idea was thought maybe they used, they tried to put her in the suitcase to leave. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the big questions here. Why would they, if you're going to, if you're going to commit, um, if you're going to commit a kidnapping, Ben, rule number one is to take the kid. Yes. Yes. Not many. That's like me stealing from Tesco's and walking out with nothing in my pocket. <laughs> It's not, you're not doing the crime you've gone out to do. So it's like, it doesn't make any sense. You're not going to get a reward if you haven't got the uh, got the body. Um, there, there is so many parts to this crime, like we said. That's why, you know, that's why it hasn't been solved. But one of the big things, one of the biggest turning points in the case, which if the police just went in the wine cellar door, the, the, the spare room door in the basement b before John Ramsey, the crime scene would have been untouched. It yeah. would have had all the DNA. It would have been tampered with in any way, shape, or form. They would have had the perfect conditions in order to actually, you know, try and investigate what investigate happened. this case. Yeah. 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 So it's it's for me. It keeps going back on Boulder Police. It's they didn't do the job properly. They decided from the very early on. No, we believe it's the parents. We're not going to really look into these other cases as thoroughly as maybe we should. They let the crime scene being, being tampered with, they let the crime scene being completely contaminated by other people. It's all done, for me, it's all kind of on their police work. Lou Smith, has, he's got loads of, t this, this documentary I watched was all based around these tapes he recorded about this about the case. He would go on to kind of look into this case year after year. Apparently on Patsy's deathbed, she said to him, please find the guy um, that did this to my daughter. And Lou, on his deathbed, said to his children, "Please carry on the search." Oh, um, and they and they're still, you know, people are still very much, very much looking into this case, especially with new new um, DNA technology coming out. And with the DNA they have, there's still hundreds of items they haven't actually tested in the DNA to see if there's anything that could possibly link. But um, you know, they have tested other things, and things haven't come up on the on the system. So, do you want to do your actual belief then? Yes. Yeah, so, so out of, out of the suspects, my belief. I I believe it to be the electrician. I believe it to be. I I don't think it was two of them that went into the household because the, there's another one high tech boot mark. I know that's like it feels a fairly loose thing. The other thing I don't get from this case is how many people had stun guns. 
I can't even name one person I know has a stun gun. Yeah. There's about five people in this case who just seem to have a stun gun. That um, fits perfectly. Yeah, Doesn't so matter. I believe that it could have been this guy wanted to make a quick buck. He's climbed to this house. He's I might have seen the film, film Ransom because it does kind of sound like yeah. a... The note seems very immature to me. It seems kind of like trying to pretend to be you know, a movie bad guy written yes, this like yeah. we're, we're a foreign faction we trust you be a smart guy it's all written in a very kind of smarmy way which to me could be someone quite young out of their depth trying to do this Elliot Roger yeah I don't think it was him no it doesn't add up no it doesn't quite but I believe he could have gone in there trying to make a quick buck um and he possibly, yeah, the the the, um, the crime did go wrong, and, and then he he scarpered. But the things about for me, it's just the things that really stand out. Yeah, it's the the boots, the gun, the fact that it seems like he's he's been murdered by someone, mm-hmm. which seems so so quickly after the press conference. Perhaps it was someone who was in for the deal on the deal with him, and they didn't want him to come forward, or they thought that the police was zeroing in on him as a suspect. Um, the fact that he yeah, he would kill animals, all those kind of like yeah. little things which usually lead to Typical very killer traits. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Again, there's there's no, the case hasn't been solved. Um yeah. so you'd like to think from these from these suspects we've said uh, that's one out of these suspects I think is most likely. I would have thought <laughs> surely if it was him, there'd be DNA from him they could have used then to, to take him to the crime. Um yeah. but this is still ongoing. I mean, yeah. who knows? In a lot of cases 20 years afterwards have been solved by DNA the Golden State Killer for example yeah, that, how that how that was solved this case I do believe this case one day will be solved um, it's just been the, 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 the waters are very well and truly muddied Ben absolutely well my my belief although I, I, I'm definitely going to check out this uh, this documentary that you've mentioned and um, I'm completely open to being disagreed with or other people putting their, their opinions on the case which I'm sure there will be and I'm excited to see those I believe it was Burke um, I believe that it all initially stemmed from the pineapple snack on the kitchen counter which I know is so so vague um, but essentially that was one of John and Benet's favourite snacks um, the, there's evidence of her fingerprints being on the bowl and there are beliefs uh, there are heavy beliefs that Burke uh, basically uh, became very very angry leading to a temper tantrum that resulted in a deadly injury for John Bonet. So my belief is that potentially he'd already tied her up um, and then attempted to maybe choke her, then picking up the torch and smacking her with it in the head. Um, my belief then is that John and Patsy woke up to this or were made, uh, um, uh, made aware by Burke either way and that they then tried to cover for Burke by then Patsy all of a sudden writing this ransom note, which they then very quickly panicked. Although it's very long, they panicked and linked it to the Christmas bonus. They basically they just lost one child. They didn't want to lose the second one. Yeah. is my belief, and that's kind of an easy finger to point. I guess. No, but- I think, and there's a lot of people I think do believe that. I think a lot of people watching this will will think that's the case. I I just found this particular one that completely changed my opinion on it all. Yeah, that's what made me believe the the, the intruder theory. The other so- weird thing about Burke, sorry, is just. Um, he then there was there's footage of him being interviewed and when they mention the pineapple he kind of covers his mouth um the fact that she was covered in a blanket apparently you would only cover that a, a victim in a blanket or cover their body if you knew the person which again is is again conjecture but he uh Burke stayed silent for many 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 years until uh 20 uh 2016 where he appeared on Dr. Phil and simply stated it was probably just some pedophile in the pageant audience and he said that twice yeah and that's a weird <clears throat> appearance as well on, on the show it's a very uncomfortable viewing looks a bit like Elijah Wood growing up doesn't he yes yeah so in conspiracy theories these ones I none of these I believe I'm going to say that straight away because they are absolutely absurd some people believe that Katy Perry is John Bonet Ramsey the mothers look similar. But I just, the fact that... Eyebrows. Oh, There's a dead body. Even though she is 10 years older, <laughs> but the argument is that she has the same eyebrows. Oh. According to the theory which took root on Twitter and Reddit, a woman who closely resembles alleged Epstein procurer, Jocelyn Maxwell, who was arrested by the F- FBI recently, is seen in the background of what is purported to be the last image of Ramsey alive. I think the last image of her was actually on the, the day, Christmas Day. Yeah. Uh, the theory also received a great deal of traction on TikTok, which, which you know, if TikTok is saying it, it's got to be true, where the image supposedly shown Maxwell in the background was sometimes shared with hashtag Pizzagate. 
Um, I don't think there's any link there whatsoever. In 2000, in the year 2000, a California woman told the police that she believed the same se child sex ring that she'd been a victim of as a child was responsible for John Bonave's death due to similar due to similarities in how they'd be tied up. Um, she was able to give specific names of individuals who, who were witnesses in the killing of John Bonet, as well as ongoing sexual and physical abuses of other children. Um, at least one source reports that it's possible John Bonet was attacked by some sort of wild animal, like an owl or a bear. God, didn't they try and blame an owl for the staircase? Yeah, that one has... Wait, I, That one I, has spider webs as well. But I, I don't remember owls uh, being able to tie a garrote. <laughs> Uh, and the and the bear, uh, they think he would fit through the the window there. He definitely would get some web on him, Ben. Um, and it certainly wouldn't explain the two and a half page ransom note because um, I don't think owls can write. Mm. No offense to any owls watching, or or bears. No bears. I want to. I'm quite happy to piss off some bears. Oh, get grizzly. Um, but they're they're the conspiracy theories, which are which yeah, none of them really hold any weight there. But yeah, the whole case is almost a conspiracy theory itself. It's such a big who done it, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of those where, as you said, one day we hope it will be solved. Mm -hmm. um, oh. We've given our opinions on it. We'd love to hear what you guys think. I'm sure what I've said, people will be shouting at their screens, thinking that I've missed out lots of details in terms of why it was the parents or why it was Burke and how it what can't be an intruder. So sh why not shout at me in the comments? Well, that, that's it. I mean, I think we could have done a two or three hour episode it on this. Could have been a six dayer, Ben. Could have been a six dayer. Um, and that's the point. There's so much to it. There's there's information. Obviously, we've tried to condense as much as we can uh, into our, our, our normal episode. I mean, we don't normally do mysteries either, so no. it's been quite a nice change. Uh, there's there's a great there's another great podcast out there. Big us up, but there's no there's a great podcast out there which specifically focus on this case with lots of interviews. Highly recommend going into them because there's there is so much to to this case, and it's yeah. And we thank you for picking such a great case. Yeah, absolutely. You've done well for your first pick. <laughs> yeah, we might possibly trust you more in the future but that was the case of, of john benet ramsey as always you know um we really appreciate your guys support thank you so much for continuing to uh, watch and listen to us for those listening we also are a visual platform so you can catch us on youtube and for those watching we are also in audio platform so if you want to pop us in your ears and go for a run then you can find us on all your podcast places like spotify and apple pods and google pods etc but in the meantime um we have uh, another two massive episodes to, to to wrap the series up on and they are coming in the next two weeks and uh they are cases that have both been requested heavily previously without giving too much away yes yeah we're very excited to bring those to you as well i've got one i've got two lookalikes <clears throat> for this story before we before we oh, end of course we can't end without a lookalike so first of all is john mark carr the uh, creepy teacher um basically any 80s band or gary newman so i i only have the one uh lookalike for this week and i've literally plucked it out of thin air john ramsey looks like fuck it we'll do it live bill o'reilly and my last one which uh people may remember the tv show sabrina the teenage witch mm -hmm. and principal craft i think he looks like the head prosecutor of the case so alex hunter the lead prosecutor of the case i think looks like um principal craft from sabrina the teenage witch yeah that's very good yeah yeah cool well there you go so we hope you enjoyed the case i hope we cut we did it just as you said it's a very big case lots to cover please go in let us know what you thought of the case and let you go go explore it more and let us know if you find anything that we've missed we would love to hear it if you enjoyed the if you enjoyed the episode please give us a like and subscribe to the channel and, and comment down below so don't forget to give us a review and give us a follow on any of the audio platforms as well we appreciate that very much and if you just can't get enough as always you can uh, support us a little bit uh more than the average bear uh, over on patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod lots of exclusive episodes there we also got... I, just, I just realized that john mark carr and gary newman's got the song is here in my car i am my car <laughs> sorry i had to i had to do that yeah there's on patreon there is plenty of cases that we've covered on their minisodes there are some mysteries on there as well. If you if you, if you liked our take on a mystery, I know we're more kind of true crime. Yeah, and we and we do requests over there as well. So let us know. Any support over there is very much appreciated. And we also have a store if you want any bits and merchandise. We have stuff on there, yeah. and any support is very gratefully appreciated. A Christmas episode this was. It might not be Christmas right now, but Christmas may be just around the corner for you. It may not be, but why not treat someone to a little? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Exactly. Ben. So, so this will be that'll be correct. <laughs> 
If you're watching this on Christmas, please let me know. I need to know. Okay, guys, until next time, like we always say, keep doing. What are you doing? Unless you're eating Burke's pineapple. Yeah, don't eat Burke's pineapple. Here in my car. See you guys. See you guys. Mm-hmm.